First Corinthians, and today we're going to be stepping into First Corinthians 11. I said that uh, a couple weeks ago when uh, Jake was about to preach, and he decided not to hardly any, use any of it because the Spirit of God was was saying something different. So we want to follow the Spirit of God. So we'll see, right? Just say, look at your neighbor and go. Well, we'll see. First Corinthians 11. We'll see. <laughs> All right, come on up, Jake. Good morning, everybody. I was joking with the porters last week. Porter, I swear someday you'll hear Rich preach. It's just not this day. <laughs> oh, you watched online. Okay. The online version is pretty good, right? It's all edited, all the... <laughs> right? We don't... No? Oh, no. Okay, not the Facebook. <laughs> oh, it's just raw. Oh, man. I'm just so thankful for the presence of God. And can we just acknowledge the fact that without the presence of God, us coming together just kind of amounts to nothing. Lots of people get together and lots of people hang out and lots of people have lots of good intentions. And good intentions, as good as the intentions are, don't yield anything outside of the Spirit of God. In fact, they just yield death and eat, sleep, repeat stuff. But thank God that His mercies are new every morning. His mercies are new every morning. As in every morning, I am just one decision away from God just wrecking my life. If I just let his presence just come and touch my life, right? And some of us need to invite the wrecking of the Holy Spirit, right? Because if he wrecks you, tears down your strongholds and you can humble yourself before the Lord, he will exalt you. How many of you guys in different seasons have tried to exalt yourself and promote yourself thinking that maybe, maybe if I just had my way, things would be better? I feel like if a lot of us were honest, all hands would go up, right? Because they're like, it, life would be better if I had my way, right? Anyone thought that before? I'm just going to keep raising my hand until some honesty shows. Okay, all right, there we go. Okay, because it happens with me. Like if people would just do what I want to do, then everything would be fine. But... Thanks be to God because his way is so much higher than my ways. And the hardest part of having a move of God and letting God move through your life is just that first part of going, my way is not the best way. Lord, I don't know. I don't know. That's a hard thing to say. Everyone practice saying it. I don't know. I don't know. It's a rare thing to happen in circles of philosophizing and theolog theolo theolo theologizing, <laughs> whatever it is, <laughs> whatever it is, guys, <laughs> whatever it is, that's a hard thing to say. Hardly ever, hardly ever do I hear um, somebody go, you know, I don't know about that. It's like, I'm going to hear an opinion first, right? Like more than anything, very rare to hear. I don't know. And when I do hear, I don't know, it's amazing how God works through humility. Cause sometimes I do hear it and it's like, Whoa, Oh, that person's special. Hey, Hey, it's awesome. That's what people see, and they're like, wow, hey, this guy's something different. I want to read something I read this morning that has nothing to do with my notes, but uh, hey, I kind of want the Shekinah glory in the house of God today. Anyone else? Yeah, baby. Hey, let's, let's take a look. So Solomon, when he's dedicating the temple, uh, this is just a snippet of what he prays in Second Chronicles 6. He says, but God will indeed, this is starting in verse 18, but God will indeed dwell with, will God indeed dwell with mankind on the earth? Praise Jesus that he did and still does. Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house which we have built. Yet 
have regard to the prayer of your servant and, his, and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant prays before you, that your eye may be open toward this house day and night. Day and night, oh, toward the place of which you have said that you would put your name there, to listen to the prayer which your servant shall pray toward this place. You guys pray towards this place? For those of you who call your church home, is this a place that you pray for? Or is it a place you gripe about? It's a little bit of both sometimes, isn't it? But Lord, let this be a house that we pray for, pray toward. We want this house to be functional. People who gripe aren't interested in solutions. They're interested in venting and feeling better about themselves. People who actually want something to change, pray in the spirit for that place. Bless your enemies. And here's the nice thing. Nobody in this church should be your enemy, right? So this should be easy. Pray for this church. Can I challenge you with that? Pray for this church. Listen to the supplications of your servant and of your people, Israel, when they pray toward this place, Lord. Hear from your dwelling place, from heaven. Hear and forgive. This is a house where we can hear from heaven. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Man, that's exciting. Hey, here's what Second Chronicles 7 starts with, and this is what I want today. This is what I want every day. But it happens a special in the house of the Lord. Now when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. All the sons of Israel seeing the fire come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave praise to the Lord saying, truly he is good. Truly his loving kindness is everlasting. Ha! Oh man, okay, hold on. It's like, that's super awesome in a variety of ways. One, the Lord responded to their sacrifice and to their obedience and to their prayer. And the glory of the Lord was so thick in that place that even the priests couldn't go in. But praise God that Jesus is our high priest and we get to actually, we can be in the room with his Shekinah glory. <laughs> this is awesome. Man, sometimes we're like so like consumed with like what, the sacrifice costs that we forget that there is a joy set before us when we take up the cross, as it says in Hebrews, that there is something in it for us. And God knows that there's something in it for us. He knows that he's a source of all good things. And he's like, like a parent, he's like, if you would just give me the one little piece of M&M that you have, I'll give you the whole ice cream cone in a Sunday but you just gotta give me that so I can put it on the ice cream. Why am I talking about my life? Hold on a second. Let's, <laughs> These are the conversations I have with my five-year-old. Guys, you can have very spiritual conversations with your five-year-olds, by the way. And I do. <laughs> I, I, that's not a joke. Man, God wants to do something with you today. Can you hear that? God has something that he wants to do with you, and not just today, every single day. God wants to have fellowship with you and communion with you. But the tough part is, is that the Holy Spirit, when he speaks, sometimes we're not listening for the Holy Spirit to think, to speak, we're listening for the Holy Spirit to say what we want to hear. Sometimes we're not listening for the Holy Spirit to speak. We go, well, where is he? Why is he not speaking? Oh, he's speaking. He's just not saying what you want to hear all the time. I'm not making this up. Jesus, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, the very next verse, it says, then the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to fast and pray for 40 nights and to be tempted by the devil. How many of you have heard a word before from God where you're like, ha ha, surely you're not saying that. I watched that YouTube video where that, you know, that televangelist was talking about how much his shoes cost and like glory to God for his shoes. So surely God, you're not leading me into the wilderness to fast for fast and pray and be tempted by the devil. Why would you do that? 
God puts us in a process to produce spiritual things in us. Spiritual things. Hey, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a spiritual, I'm a spiritual thang. <laughs> You're a spiritual thang. Hey, here's the deal. I mean, when you, like, I honestly, just like, it, it, like, it makes me almost like foaming at the mouth, like angry, like watching this preacher, literally, I, f- I forget his name, so I won't say it. That's probably for the best. Maybe you like him. But there's this, there's this guy who's standing there who's literally bragging about how big his house is and how much this blazer costs, literally talking about it. He's like, ah, oh, yes, the Lord's good to me. And I'm like, I'm highly, highly suspicious that your shoes and your shirt and the quality of your house sequestered away in wherever it is results in any spiritual fruit. And that's what the Lord is interested in, right? No one here is going to have a U-Haul behind their hearse, okay? So God is obviously not interested in you reaping material things. If you do, fantastic, good on you. But it has nothing to do with what God wants to produce in you spiritually, in fact, we just got to like hold everything that we have loosely. I'm certainly not going to brag about it, right? If I have good stuff, awesome. If God wakes me up in the middle of the night and says, give away your, you know, your $800 shoes, I'm going to be like, oh no, no, I'm going to give it away. <laughs> the day that I have $800 shoes, guys, <laughs> I think if I had $800, it wouldn't go to shoes. <laughs> I can think of a lot of other things that I need in my life right now, like car tires or something. We are spiritual beings. We're made to be spiritual people. The spiritual is real. Rich, the other day on a Friday, I'm going to throw him under the bus, but he doesn't care because this is good stuff. He's like, I'm talking. He like literally interrupts what I'm saying. He's like, hold on. Spiritual stuff is real. Grab my hand. I'm like, okay. And he starts just praying for me in the spirit and just praying that there just be an impartation in the middle, right in front of Starbucks. People are probably walking by like, (laughs) awesome, right? This is awesome. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? I'll have what they're having. Yeah. The only thing that produces any valuable fruit is the Holy Spirit working through us, and our lives must be oriented around the spiritual truth of Christ and Him crucified. Otherwise, we're living no life at all, but stuck in death. You guys hear that? If our life does not revolve around Christ as the foundation, the Bible said no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Which means if we are off somewhere else, we are off somewhere else. We're not on the foundation of Christ Jesus. Christ says that himself, the man who builds on the rock, his house will be saved. If all of my time and energy is over here and I and my life revolves around me and I build things around my life. If I build things around my life, how many of you guys are honest? Your life is built around what you wanna do. Oh, come on, come on. Humble yourselves before the Lord, people. How many of you literally schedule your lives around you? When you're looking at your calendar, you're not thinking, well, God might move that day, (laughs) right? You don't look at your calendar and look at your, your bills and look at your life. Like, guys, this is a real thing that I am contending with right now. So, you know, rebuke condemnation. Because again, his mercies are new every morning. If this is something like, man, my life does revolve around me. Well, then don't. Then get away from that. Build your life on the foundation. You can start today. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can start today. You can start today. Order now. Order now. <laughs> Call 555. Yeah, anyway. We got to build our house on the rock because when the fire comes, because the fire will come, it will just consume everything. And if you're not on the rock, then, well, you're not on the rock, right? And fill in the blank there. So I had this picture, I got this picture for at least my life and God started to show me how it connects to the church that so often, if you ever want to test, and this is what this message is about today, guys, we're going to test ourselves examine ourselves. We're going to consider our works, as we'll see in the scripture. The Lord wants us to do that. And there's this picture of like a, of like a nucleus, like a cell, and with all, any science people in here, what's it called? Is it the neutrons or something that orbit the nucleus? So Christ wants to be the center of our life the center of our existence. 
And if you ever want to test yourself and you want to go, Lord, are you the center of my life? Well, then you just ask, when things go wrong, when things go awry, when things get tough, where do I touch base? Where do I go back to? I can speak for myself. I can speak for many of us. Up until maybe the last month, I'm not even kidding. God's been working on me on this. The most of my life, six days a week, is my time. Sunday is God's. Christ isn't only not my center in that case. He's like one of thousands of other things orbiting who? Me. My life is centered around me. When things go wrong and I start using language like, oh, I have to do this. Oh, you know what? The next thing I do, I got to do this. I got to work on this. I figured that, you know, based on this. And sometimes it's all very spiritual sounding things, right? And we have, we are experts, guys. Again, if you're honest with yourself and you're humbling yourself before the Lord right now, we are experts at spiritualizing very carnal ideas, right? We are experts at it. Like, you know, the whole, the whole me time thing, the whole thing that like justifies when things go wrong, I have to withdraw and I have to recoup, right? And it's like, while recouping is a thing, that, that's, that's a real thing, by the way, guys. There are seasons where you need to rest. You know what's not a real thing? You can't recoup yourself. You cannot recoup yourself. You are not the one. Anything you do, you can't do any amount of me time or sequestered time or alone time that's going to produce anything in you. Your heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. And so you're just like sequestering yourself away to just have self-talk eat at you until your spirit is dead. So where do you go? Well, if the Christ is my center, I go to Christ. And where is Christ? Well, he's here in this church. He's with you in your spirit. And you just seek him. God, what are you doing? God, what are you saying? Lay yourself down before him and pray. When we worry, man, we just got to rebuke worry. We just got to rebuke it. Rebuke it. In the name of Jesus, worry be gone. Because worry is just the cyclone of self. Just, you know, like spinning it out. Well, I'm just, and then, hey, guess what? Oh, man, we find all sorts of ways to spiritualize worry, too. What do we call it? I'm concerned. I'm concerned about your salvation. <laughs> that was for you, Caleb. I'm concerned. Well, I have to be whatever it is, right? Oh, man, I've heard people call it wise before, and you're like, oh, oh, right? It's like, well, I'm just being wise. I'm like, no, you're worrying. You're worrying. Stop worrying. Go to God. What you're concerned about, God's concerned about for you. He just knows it better than you do. So go to the source. Go to the source. Go to the source. Let's make Christ our center. How many moves of God are we potentially missing out on because we're listening to the cravings and comforts of our carnality and not heeding the call of the Holy Spirit? So far, I'm totally off my notes, guys, so there we go. You're welcome. <laughs> but Saul, anointed king of Israel. He's anointed the king of Israel, and he decides in a moment, and if you circle all the eyes and the me's and the my thoughts that Samuel says when he's trying to justify to Samuel why he did what he did, He's like, well, I thought, I, I had thought when this happened that, it, well, surely it would be better if I did this and I did that and, and then I did this. And, and, and Samuel's like, lul, 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 stop. You disobeyed the voice of the Lord. You knew what you needed to do. You heard it and you thought better? You thought better? No, from this day forward, you're done. Ha! Yikes. Man, whoo. Can we have like a heart of repentance in here? If there's anyone where it's like there's been a word over your life, God, God spoke to you and you knew it and you thought better, oh, just start praying for yourself, even in the spirit to just repent, get back on the track. Like, no, God, let that not be me. Let me come back to your word. I heard someone say once that 
like for those for for people who are like I literally I haven't heard the spirit of of God in a long time like since this time this this preacher was like okay we'll go back to the last thing he said and obey it and he's like well now that I think about it I did not do that <laughs> right and it is interesting how that works and that's happened in my life before too where it's like you know I just feel starved of spiritual oxygen and God's like well you guys ever taken a typing test before like a speed typing test it won't let you go if if you don't do it exactly right it'll stop I sometimes feel like God's like, come over here. And you're like, no, I don't want to go there. And you start trying to advance in the Lord without doing that. And God's still sitting over here at the ticker like, he'll get it eventually. He's going to come back, right? Like you need to <laughs> go and stop. Quit your worrying. Quit your typing. Look at the thing that's telling you, oh, I missed the T. Oh, and we continue, right? Anyone need to do that sometimes? Reset. God, let me go back to where I stumbled and let <laughs> And help me, help me, God. Paul says in Romans 6, 16, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? If in the end you're going to be a slave to something either way, who would you rather call master? I mean, uh, you know, us Americans are like, you know, hyper-independent, awesome, yay, okay, cool. Point, find that in the Bible for me, please. But anyway, um, it's like, you know, there's this thing, there's this idea, the scripture saying, no, 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 you're going to be a slave to something. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Don't you know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? You are not your own. You're bought with a price. I'd rather be a slave of righteousness than a slave to my sin that results in all kinds of death. Amen? Paul continues in Romans 6 to say, But thanks be to God that though you were, you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am in speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, funny how that works, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. I, I, I sometimes wonder aloud, like, why, why we struggle so much with the obedience that God, God's word clearly asks for. Anyone struggle with that? Like, I struggle with that, and I've struggled with that in different seasons. I, I sometimes just, like, rankle when people start talking about obey. Like, the word obey starts to become a trigger word where you're, like, like you're developing a twitch in your eye every time you hear it. Like, obey. Uh, uh, right? I, I don't know why. Why do we have that war inside us that tries to escape the calling to obedience, and we justify our selfish, carnal works? Do we not know that it is our very obedience that sanctifies us, as it says in the Scriptures? that with each step of obedience to God's word and is now speaking Holy Spirit, it gets better. It gets easier. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He did not die for us to willingly clap ourselves back in our chains to sin because we're deluded into thinking our rebellion will result in some more desirable thing. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Now, I'm going to I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I think I know why some of us on a philosophical, you know, lofty thinking level uh and I, I'm speaking for myself here because this is where I've been in the past. Obedience for me, it's really easy for me to justify it as like legalism and then stop listening. Right? But that's kind of like what Paul addresses like three, four times in Romans and Corinthians where it's like, well, okay, yes. Christ has given you all this grace and all this freedom, but not for you to just, like, max out your, the pleasures of your flesh. Because the Bible says very clearly you cannot serve both mammon and God. You can't have a mind set on flesh things and get spirit results. And so if you're like, I, I want to move of God, I have never seen the fruit of my works has never been satisfying to me, I want to move of God, then God is going to call you out of your fleshly ways into the spiritual ways. 
And if your, re if your rebellion in you, which part of me, but that's, that's what it is, if your rebellion in you is like, well, I don't want to do that, then you, we, we got to die to ourselves and let God work through us. Legalism is when you think that you doing something produces any salvation for you or for anyone else. Because it doesn't. That's true. Sometimes the focus is, here's what happens when you think that. When you think my works get me into heaven, well, that's baloney, that's hogwash, and all that leads to is condemnation. Because guess what happens? You can't do it. We already talked about that. When you're trying to recoup, when you have your me time, and you're like, I, 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 I need to do these things for myself right now. I need to do these things for myself, right? Like when, when you're trying to do that and you fail and you can't do it because guys, you can't. So stop trying. When you can't, what does the enemy do? What do you do to yourself? You fail. They are all looking at you and laughing at you. Ha <laughs> ha! You failed yet again. You can't do it right. You can't do it right. You will never do it right. And the deliverance from that is, yep, that's right. But thanks be to God who has done the work of salvation for me already and is just calling me in faith to walk in his purposes. It's like, guys, it's like God has just blown open this door for you to walk through and you're still in the other room where all your sin is. Salvation is the door's open already. There's no work of yours that you did to open that door. It's open. But God's saying, come on, step in. And you're like, but that's legalism. No, it's called walking. It's called walking. It's called stepping one foot in front of the other. God's like, come on, come on. There is joy over here. You're like, ah, oh, but I know this stuff. <laughs> I know all these things. Better, like, better the, 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 it's the lesser known evil, right? Now, there's no evil in God up ahead. And every hardship just produces character and endurance and hope. So walk that way. It's not legalism. It's called a life lived by the Spirit, free from sin. Get out of that grave. Get out of that grave. Turn to your neighbor and say that, could you? And say it weirder than me. Get out of that grave. Come on. The deal is, if we get used to, if we get used to a pattern of life where we just routinely just go, I don't have to do that. I don't want to do that. My life's supposed to be comfortable. I'm just, and we just, you know, have that cyclone. Paul, rewinding in chapter 1 in Romans, Paul says, For even though they, the world, and he is talking about everybody, if you're reading Romans 1, for they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile, fruitless in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. Sound familiar? But here's what I'm excited about, guys. I don't know if you guys feel this, but I feel this. And ever since, like, when Nick was here from Alaska and he started talking about this and started talking about this next generation, I'm like, that's true. You know, I, I'm, like, scrolling through Instagram, a very holy way of spending my time, I know. And um, there's, like, there's these people in Gen Z and comedians who are, I'm watching this comedian, he's so vulgar. Man, he's, he's swearing all over the place. And while he's joking about it, man, what an interesting thing he was talking about. He's making fun of how it takes just as much faith logically to believe that nothing created everything than it is for God to create everything. And he's literally going towards being like, you know, he's, he's talking about, I think we've been made by somebody. And I, you know why I think this is happening? Is because I think the whole feudalness of this world, man has accomplished a whole lot of stuff, right? Man, we have, we have social media. We have more and more ways of connecting with people. We've got, we've got these super cool cars and we've got like more efficient way of, you know, doing things and like, you know, QR codes and right? All this fun stuff. And what's amazing is it's just getting worse. It's getting worse. And the younger generation is looking at like mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, I thought you guys ran the world. Why is the world 
a flaming piece of garbage. Why? Why? What's going on? Our, our work is yielding nothing. So people are starting to look into, they start to see places like this, like Solomon prays about in his temple, where people start to see the glory of God is in here. Anyone feel the glory of God when he walked in here? You know, what's amazing is that like when you have a group of people who humble themselves before the Lord and just let God work through them, I just hear God saying eh, over and over, eh, over and over again, every time I get before God, he goes, the things that I can do through a people who would just humble themselves before the Lord. It takes humility to obey. And if I think, if I can't humble myself and obey what the Lord is saying, then all is going to happen is, is just my pride is going to produce things, and that just produces death. It's not about trying not to sin. There's no faith in Christ in him crucified there when you try to make it about you, trying not to sin anymore. It's having the audacity to think I can stop sinning. It's backwards. Just obey Christ. Don't focus on what not to do. Listen for what to do. Read the scriptures for what to do. It's not about salvation. God's given you that. That is the free gift of God through Christ Jesus. This is about pursuing all the things Christ has for you and living in a new day, free from the bondage of sin, of vice and flesh and death. Walk by the Spirit. Walk. It's a verb. It's a direction. It's away from here. On to there. Praise God. 1 Corinthians 11 says that we are not the leader. Christ is. We are not the leader. Christ is. Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of every woman. And at the head of Christ is God. God has a design. And when you try to do things outside of the design from God, you just break stuff. You just break stuff. God wants us to operate in design. It takes faith to obey and walk by the Spirit, but just a little. Isn't that awesome? You guys ever think about that? I don't have enough faith. Do you have any faith? Yeah, I think I have some. That'll do. Does anyone have a little faith in here? Can I get a little hand? You have a little faith? You're still sitting here, which means there must be something. It took Peter just a little faith to walk on the water. It took Peter just a little faith. He did a very pretty supernatural thing that, like, you know, we don't give him a lot of credit for when Jesus pulled him up, he said, you have little faith. Your little faith can walk on water. Imagine if Peter had walked on water and didn't look and had a lot of faith. What are the odds that he keeps seeing fruits of that faith? Pretty high, I think, right? Keep walking. Jesus says, you are my friends if you obey my commandments in John 15, 14. Paul says in Romans 8, 14, for all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Get up from your mat and walk. Go and sin no more. God wants that for us. God wants you. Get up from your mat, walk, go and sin no more. My question is, what is our flesh-centered lifestyle led to? What it, has it resulted? Is anyone hungry for different results in their life? Are you hungry for different results? Some of us may be satisfied. I think there's, there's a variety of people in here. There are some people who are destitute in here who are like, I just, I just need my life to change. God can do that. Some of you are like, ah, uh, me, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a problem. <laughs> denial, right? Like, but you might be like, I, I, I think I'm okay. And I think God wants to come to you this morning and show you the more that's in him. And he wants to show you that he can move through you. Does everybody in this room prophesy? Unlikely. Do you know that all of you could? That you could hear the voice of the Lord and he can speak through you? And it just takes Humility and obedience and fellowship with God every day. Why every day? Because that is a life where he's your foundation. If you picture Christ being like the foundation of your home, everybody, home's home base. We go back home. When we're done doing whatever, we go back home. 
flip it around in your mind a little bit that every time you go home, you go to work, you're stepping on a foundation of Christ and you're fellowshipping with him and you're listening to him. And you are somebody who can speak the word of the Lord in a moment, not just when the piano's playing, right? The spirit of the Lord is not an atmosphere. He's a person who wants to have a relationship with you. The Lord provoked my heart to look in the book of Haggai, and that's when you know it's the Lord, right? <laughs> You're like, I'm not even sure I can pronounce that. And I'm not even sure if I'm saying it right. But the revelation of the Lord just jumped out of me in this book. And here's what I read in Haggai 1, 5 through 9. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Anyone relate? Especially the purse with holes part. <laughs> Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountain, bring wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house, which lies desolate while each of you runs to his own house. This scripture freaked me out because I'm like, God, why are you showing me this? Why are you showing me this? but that I consider where we're at in the world, where the American church is at in the world. And I go, I ask myself, is the Lord's house lying desolate? Ask yourself, is the Lord's house lying desolate? And for some, even in some spiritual ways, it may feel like that. All you can do about the church, whether it's this church or another church, is you just have vitriol for it and you feel justified in your ability to condemn it and look at everything that's wrong, and you count yourself more spiritual for not being involved in it, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. God is calling you to rebuild his desolate house. How can we stand aside after all that God has done for us and just go, it deserves to be in rubble? Yeah, if it's built of flesh things, yeah, wood, hay, straw, let's get rid of it. Yeah, amen but is the Lord's house desolate? And God is saying, I want a place for my glory to come and consume the offering and burn it, to be a place that you have a hard time even walking into because my presence is so thick and moving in here. God is calling a remnant of his people to go, to be corrected, to come to him in reverence, to be humble and to obey as he stirs up the people in Haggai. Here's what it says. And Haggai goes on to say the Lord stirred up a remnant among his people. Here's the sad thing, and I have to realize this. The teacher in me just wants everybody to get on board, everybody to hear the word of the Lord and do it. And I have to just realize the sad truth that not even everybody in this room is going to hear the, Lord, the word of the Lord and do it because your hearts have been darkened and you're hard to this. I believe that God can shake things up, but the truth is it will be a remnant that can come together. Is there a remnant in this place? Is there even just a few of us who go, that's right, Lord, and I'm gonna put my hands to work. There's a generation in here who remembers the glory of the Lord. As it says in Haggai, the Lord asks Zerubbabel, he goes, go to the people in the city and ask them, do you remember what the glory of the Lord was like? And is it anything like what it is now? The answer is kind of an obvious no. Like they would go, no, it's not like that. Okay, then help us build it, come on. And he says in chapter two, verses six through nine, once more in a little while, this is the Lord speaking, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and they will come with the wealth of all nations and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of, Ho the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. This is a word for this church. Like I feel it in like my very bones that this is a word for this church. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. Let that sink in, especially for those of you who've been here a while. 
the latter glory of this house, as in the glory yet to come, will be greater than the former. He will give peace in this place. And the Lord is looking for a remnant in this body who will worship and obey, who will center their lives once again around the Lord. Again, is there a remnant in here? We all obey something already. Who is our master? Romans 8, 5 through 6, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. I don't know about you, I want some life and peace. Second Corinthians 13, 5, Paul says, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. Jesus Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of whom who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. Jesus lives in you. And the power of Jesus wants to work through you. Don't fear about failing the test. Examine your life. And perhaps you find that your life doesn't resemble this picture of a spirit-filled, Jesus-driven existence. I mean, you would fail the test, as Paul says. All right, so what do you do? Believe. Ask of God and he will give it to you. He already has. It is the free gift of God that is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The act of repentance is quick. Turn around. About face. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. When we partake in communion, for example, as Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 11, and we will next week. We'll talk about that in a second. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 28, that a man must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. What does this mean? It means that communion with God is a spiritual act and meant to be a spiritual act done by spiritual people. Much of this can be explained earlier in chapter 11. In verses 17 to 24, Paul writes, But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, for the worse. Pause there for a second. Let that sink in. You come together not for the better, but for the worse. Do you guys realize, like we said before, there is a version of this church where we come together not for the better, but for the worse. If we come together as a group of natural bodies set in fleshly ways, we come together not for the better, but for the worse. Coming together for the sake of coming together is nothing. Coming together outside of being submitted to the spirit of God and the spiritual things of God is not the kingdom. Paul says at the end of this letter to the Corinthians that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. In 1 Corinthians 11, here's some of the backstory. He says, for in the place, in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I will not praise you. The church and its practices in the Corinthian church have become a place centered around them and their needs and their culture. It become nothing more than a club where people could be elevated or bumped off the hill. Factions and divisions ro rose up all over the place so that ideas, principles, and approved people could be glorified instead of Christ Jesus. When people are glorified more than Christ Jesus. In Samuel, that's the reason that God sends a prophet to Eli to say, there was a word for your house, 
for your church. There was a word for you and your family that you would last forever. But then you decided to go and give everything that God had given you to glorify your sons over me. And the Lord says, I, I take that back. I will raise up another who will be faithful to my word. God wants to raise up people who will be faithful to his word. People who don't, aren't obsessed with glorifying and making life work the way I want it to work, but people who are obsessed and ruined for nothing less than to see God move through people's hearts and move through his church no matter what it costs them. Paul says some pretty intense things. He even says, I would trade my salvation if it meant the salvation of this people. Can you guys imagine saying that? I read that and I get uncomfortable reading that. But that's called being ruined for the things of God, where it's not even about what I get out of it anymore. It's that, man, I feel so much joy and purpose in the call of God where my, the fruits of the Spirit are feeding the people who need it. Come on. Don't you guys wanna be agents of change? Again, I ask you, what benefit has your fleshly lifestyle reaped for you? Do you feel like the people in Haggai where you're spinning and toiling and you can never bring in enough? You got a hole in your purse. And God's saying, I will show you where you can be filled and where you can be overflowing. And it's in rebuilding my house, which lies desolate before you. I'm not even talking about just Verge Church, guys. I'm talking about his church with a capital C rebuild his church, build his church, pray for his church that his Shekinah glory would come and fill it. We need spiritual things. Has anything of our agenda produced squat in this place other than your unhappiness and your bitterness? Nothing. Are we hungry for the spiritual things of God? Come on. Are we hungry for the spiritual things of God? Come on, we can do it. Humble yourselves before the Lord and let him work through you. Guys, I've never prophesied in my life that much before like three weeks ago. And you know what? I asked God because the Bible says earnestly desire the greater gifts. I'm like, well, God, I'd like to get better at speaking in tongues and I'd like to prophesy. Can you do that for me? And the next day, what am I doing? Prophesying for people, praying in tongues. The Lord wants to fill you with all good and perfect things. And he knows that he's the source of it. And he's saying, let go of your idea of good things and come to me. You right now are fishers of stinky fish, but come to me and I will make you fishers of men. Forget the fish, okay? Forget the fish. If you get anything out of this, forget the fish. This is not a message of condemnation. This is a message of deliverance. Is Christ the center of your life? If no, make him. No condemnation. If you say no, all right, make him the center of your life. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The door is already open. Step into it. Hebrews 12, one through three says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, hey guys, turn to yourself and say, I have a cloud of witnesses. You do, you do, you have a cloud of witnesses surrounding you. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangled us. Let it go and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What do you do when you're growing weary and losing heart? You're considering yourself, now consider God who has suffered so much more than you, so you can walk, not so that you could be in your chains and in your bondage, but so that you can walk in freedom and walk in the full power of how he wants to operate through you. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Time to walk. This is for people in this room. 
Because Jesus' death in the flesh has resulted in his resurrected power and glory, so also our death to our flesh results in our being glorified with him, as it says in Romans. As joy was set before him as he took up his cross, so also there is joy set before us if we could just run the race that is set before us. There is a race set before us and we can run it because Christ has run it first. And he is on the throne. He is with us always until the end of the age. Consider Christ and all that he has suffered so you will not grow weary and lose heart. There's a race set before you. There's joy set before you. When the revelation of the kingdom of God wrecks you and ruins you for nothing less, you will be like the man Jesus describes who discovers that field and sells everything he has to own it, to buy it, to lay hold of it. We worry about the cost, but who worries about the cost of something they know is everything, is everything. There's no buyer's remorse in the kingdom of God. I don't know, guys, think about this. I don't know a single person who has paid the cost who regrets it. Think about that for a second. All five-star reviews, people. Come on. I don't want to be like the rich man before Christ and walk away shamed and saddened by the price tag. I want to go all in. Because I know that the kingdom of God is a kingdom worth living and dying for. I've tasted and seen what this world has to offer, spit it out of my mouth. I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good and righteous and holy and worthy and whatever it costs, whatever it takes, I'll pursue that. Because just like the prodigal son, I would rather be a slave in the house of God than a ruler in the world where death and vice have their way with souls. I would rather be a slave of righteousness than a slave of sin for another moment longer. Spiritual things are real. Turn to someone and say, I'm a spiritual person. And this is a spiritual church. Oh, come on, say it like it means something. This is a spiritual church. This is a spiritual church. And if spiritual things are real, there's an altar here right now. We're just the act of obedience and coming up. Not for me, I'm gonna get out of here. <laughs> that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't come up here to me. Come up here to the presence of God where there's space here for you to bow your knee, for you to lay your life down and give to God what is God, which is your body. Present your bodies. Guys, present your bodies to the Lord as a living sacrifice. It doesn't say present your thoughts. It doesn't say think really hard about what it would be like to go up there. Come on up and present your bodies to him as a living sacrifice. There's a remnant in this room who is able and willing to do that. Amen? Present your bodies. Step in. Come on, let's go up. I'll join you.